Okay, our next speaker is Mr. Peter Zion. He was a geopolitical strategist, and he combines a deep understanding of geography, demography, energy, and trade to help his clients make sense of a complicated world. Fortune 500 companies, trade associations, policymakers, and government agencies at all levels regularly rely on his expertise. Peter is also a critically acclaimed author. His first two books, The Absent Superpower and The Accidental Superpower, are recommended by Mitt Romney, Ian Bremmer, and Fareed Zachariah. His latest project, Disunited Nations, became available in March 2020. And his fourth book, The End of the World is Just Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization, has just become available this month. So we're looking forward to hear his perspective on the changes in the world. Thanks for being here, Peter. Now this here, this is how you do a Texas accent. You just have to walk around like you don't care. That's how you own a room. Now, I talk about the end of the world, and until very recently, it's been relatively hypothetical. <laughs> and yet here we are. So I'm gonna cover a lot of ground very quickly, and I'm gonna be lingering around through lunch so you guys can like beat me up in a corner because I'm probably gonna ruin a lot of business plans in the next 45 minutes. But you know, better that you know what's coming than not. Uh, I'm gonna focus a lot of today's presentation on the input side of things. Uh, there is no way you can have a healthy hog operation in a modern world without just massive volumes of soy and corn. They are by far the input that matters the most to you and soy and corn production globally is going to shit. Except here. Here we've got where the corn comes from. Yikes. Ukraine number four has already fallen off the market. It is never coming back. Here's soy. Brazil is falling off the market and it is never coming back. How do you run a hog operation without soy or corn? Well, the answer is you don't, or at least it's not for export. So either you can access it or you're out of business. Here we are the world's largest producer of both soy and corn. I am not concerned about your input streams. Maybe I'm a little concerned about the pricing structure. I think that's unavoidable. But if you only take one thing away from the, this presentation, take this. Most of your competition will not be there in three years. We're at that point now. Okay, let's start with the war. Yeah, everyone's like <laughs> 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 Now, here are some maps of the central Russian space. You have to turn your head a little bit because they're from the books. That's okay, I'm not gonna judge out loud. Uh, this is a population density map, and that V of light orange going from Central Europe down into Central Siberia, that is where all the Russians live. That is the only part of the Russian space where the climate is tolerable. So in the winter, you're talking northern Minnesota in terms of temperature with the aridity of western Kansas, and that's as good as it gets in Russia. That's where you live. Whoa. The light orange is roughly a population density of the eastern half of Nebraska if you melon scoop out Lincoln and Omaha. So you have neighbors, you know their names, you don't see them every week, okay? That's where everyone lives. Now, if you go over to this map, same area, that's the orange here is overlaid by the green here. This is an economic and climate map. And that green is the Russian wheat belt. That is home to roughly 95% of their agricultural production because it's the only place that the land doesn't completely suck. If you move to the right, to the blue, you get tundra and taiga, I think northern Canada, with worse food. If you go to the left, you go to the yellow, you're in desert, think Phoenix, without retirees, <laughs> okay? When Russians look at this, they get really depressed, not because of the bad food or the bad weather, but because of the beige. Because the beige is flat, it's open, but it's dry, and it's either too hot or too cold. You can't really live there, you can't grow anything, there's no population. But if you have a Mongol horde or a panzer division, you can just roll right through that territory and go right into the green. And so the Russians have been invaded 50 odd times in their history because they can't defend it. Their population density is low. They can't do a mobile defense because they can't afford it. They can't even build the roads. Russia still doesn't have a road network. They've got a rail network. Now, the Russian goal since the time of Catherine the Great 
has been to expand beyond the green and through the beige until they get to these red arcs. These are the zones where you cannot run a Mongol horde. There's mountains, or they're too de deserty, or there's water. And then they want to forward position static troops, because they don't have mobile troops, static troops, in the gateway access points between those barriers. There's nine of them. Under the Soviet period, the Russians controlled all nine for the first time in their history, most secure they've ever been. Soviet Union collapsed in 92. They went from nine to one. And everything that the Russians have done under Putin since has been about getting boots on the ground in the other eight. This is the Georgia War. This is the Kazakh intervention. This is the Nagorno-Karabakh War between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is the Crimea War a few years ago. Ukraine isn't the end, it's the mid-step. And even worse, it's not that the Russians aren't going to stop until they have all of Ukraine, because Ukraine is not in one of these gateways. It's on the way to two of them, though. So it's not that the Russians are not gonna stop until they have all of Ukraine, it's that the Russians will not stop when they have all of Ukraine. This war was always going to happen. Without it, the Russians die. We all know a Texan, right? And they just won't shut up about how big their state is. <laughs> Texas is not as big as they think. Russia has borders three times the size of ours. They're trying to defend them with half the population and without a road network. This is the only way to make it work. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on right now. The deep red are the zones that the Russians controlled on February 22nd when the war began. The pink are the areas that they have grabbed since. There's four big things going on. First of all, that initial assault that we saw from Belarus down to Kiev. I need to snag my water here. Thank you. You didn't drink it, did you? This is safe. All right. You guys remember that giant convoy, 40 miles long? ABCs, tanks, military vehicles? Remember how it stalled on day three of the war because they forgot fuel trucks? Fuel trucks? Most people missed that on day seven of the war, most of the soldiers had to dismount from their equipment and walk back to Belarus because they also forgot food supplies. Now, my buddies at the Defense Department we're like really excited when this happened. Like, holy crap, the Russians don't know how to fight a war. If we ever fight them directly, we're just gonna wipe the floor with them. And then they all had a nap and some bourbon and really thought some deep thoughts about it. Like, holy crap, the Russians don't know how to fight a war. If we ever face them directly, we're gonna wipe the floor with them. And they see this as an existential conflict for their very survival, which means nukes come into play almost immediately. We can't let that happen. Sure, Star Wars has come a long way in the last 30 years. It's not that good. The Russians have over 1,000 nukes. We can't allow that direct fight to happen. And since we know they won't stop when they have all of Ukraine, that they're coming for countries to the West, all of which are in NATO, and so we are treaty bound to defend them, we have to make sure that that never happens. We have to kill the Russian military here and now so that it can never act again. And that means every weapon system that we possess, that we can train the Ukrainians on in a short period of time, they can have. So no jets, no F-35s, no battleships, no advanced systems, because that would just take too long. Anything else is game. There's a problem, though. Those systems exist in limited volume because we, for the most part, don't use them ourselves. We don't use stingers because we have a freaking air force. Use stingers when you don't have an air force. We don't use javelins because we have tank divisions. At current rates, we're gonna run out of stuff to give them within the year. We don't even make stingers anymore. The last government order for that was 11 years ago. We're rebuilding the supply chains as quickly as we can but just replacing the javelins that we've already given them would take three and a half years. There's a time issue. Okay, now obviously that assault failed. The second big push started from the occupied territories and converged on the city of Mariupol on the Sea of Azov. Now obviously this is important from the point of view that it's a land bridge, but most people don't understand just how critical that is for the Russians. The Russians don't fight via truck. They're not a mobile warfare military. They fight 
brain. And that makes this the most strategic asset in the conflict to date. This is the Kerch Strait Bridge. They built it after the Crimea War back in 2014, I think, yeah, 14. It's a rail bridge that connects Crimea directly to mainland Russia. Uh-oh. I think we've run out of, oh, there we go. I'll just move over there if I have to. The Russians fight by train, and this is the supply point for the two million Russians who live in occupied Crimea. Crimea is not Missouri. It imports all of its food. It's arid. It imports all of its food from the Russian mainland. It's one bridge. And now that we're getting more capable weapons into the hands of the Ukrainians, the Kerch Bridge is probably not long for this world. And if it falls, their only line of supply to their population centers in Crimea and the entire western part of the front is Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back, guys. I'll just stand over here for a while, unless that's detachable. This one on? Maybe, maybe? Can you hear me? There we go. Wow, that's a really short cord. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the only way that Ukraine can win this is if number one, they take out the bridge, and number two, they recapture Mariupol, and they have to do it this calendar year. If they fail to do it this year, they run out of gear. And we've all seen the, the, the hilarious videos of about how badly the Russians are doing and how they're dusting off tanks that were now made in the 60s because they ran out of the good stuff. But riddle me this, in a contest between badly trained, badly equipped, Russian forces with tanks that are 40 years old, or highly motivated, lightly trained Ukrainian infantry with no weapons, who wins? You know, there's, there's no math here. And then it becomes a partisan conflict. And we're not the only ones who took some lessons away from the Battle of Kyiv. The third big push is here. The Russians are trying to turn this into a pocket, advancing from the south and the north to trap the most advanced best trained, best equipped Ukrainian forces into a pocket that they can then destroy. Their lesson from the Battle of Kyiv was that they're not gonna be welcomed in as saviors after all. And that means the entire population is forfeit. And so the Russians have dusted off a strategy that they developed back before World War I. They recreated for the wars in Chechnya and in the Syrian civil war with the devastation of Aleppo. And they are using their artillery to advance very, very slowly under a hail of incendiary fire, deliberately targeting every piece of civilian infrastructure they can see with an emphasis on agricultural infrastructure. Cold chain, ports, grain silos, tractors. They've got lots of reasons to go after tractors. Oh, come on, that was hilarious. <laughs> you guys, like, there are hedges now in front of the Ministry of Defense in Kyiv that they have carved to be a Ukrainian tractor dragging a, U a Russian tank. It's hilarious. Anyway, hi. Oh, sure. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, ah. Cables. Okay. Uh, everything's forfeit. The goal here is to force the population of Ukraine to self-separate into two groups. The first group become refugees. You never have to worry about them again. Anyone who stays behind is clearly a fighter and you can shoot them on sight. So they've brought in the Wagner group, which is their uh, mercenary group, and they've brought in the Chechens to basically sweep any population centers that they've captured. We now know from both uh, the operations north of Kyiv and near Kharkiv, as well as radio intercepts by the Germans, that what happened in Bucha, the war crimes, has happened in at least 70 other populated areas. We just can't confirm it because most of them are behind Russian lines. Third, or fourth, 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 shit. <laughs> We might need another, another battery. Uh, it's not working on here. Is it on this guy? You did? Okay. Do I, do I, yeah, it's giving me the low battery thing, so. But is it this? There we go. Okay. Here, that's for you, too. Okay. Isn't this fun? <laughs> no, it's that Canadian guy. They take everything. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. All right, so uh, finally, this is Odessa. Now, Odessa is not a normal city. It is at the mouth of the Dnieper River, which is kind of their equivalent of the Mississippi. And it is also their manufacturing center. It's a cultural hub, it's a financial center. So it is New York and Houston and St. Louis and Chicago and New Orleans all in one. And if the Russians succeed in capturing it, that is the end of Ukraine as a modern economic entity. Right now, Odessa is under blockade. They can't export anything. This has been the source of 95% of their exports to this point. At maximum hope, they can send 10 to 15% of their stuff out via rail to Europe. That's assuming everything goes right and the Russians stop targeting rail systems. 10 to 15%, that's as good as it gets. That's not great. Okay. What's next? There we go. Uh, if you treat the Russians, the Ukrainians, and the Belarusians as a single entity, and from an economic point of view in warfare, that's the best way to do it. Everything in the first column, they are collectively the world's largest exporter, and then second in the second column, and so on. Uh, I could spend six hours on this. I have. I want to just focus on three main points. First of all, energy. Uh, this isn't North Dakota. I mean, yes, North Dakota is just balls cold, but Siberia is a whole other thing. It's got something called permafrost, where if you go down five feet, the ground is frozen solid for the 20 feet below that. You guys are in the Midwest, you get it. In the winter, if you move, you're okay, but if you stop, you die. Same in the permafrost. Oil that's moving through the permafrost zone up out of the ground if for whatever reason it has to stop, because of boycotts, because of sanctions, because of infrastructure damage, doesn't matter why, it freezes in the pipe. And water comes up as a byproduct of oil production. All good? Woohoo! Yes. Thank you. And the pipes crack. And you can never use that system again. The last time we had a shutoff in the Russian export system was 1992 when the Soviet system collapsed. It took them 30 years to bring it all back online. They didn't finish until last December. So at some point this year, we're going to lose four to six million barrels a day of Russian crude, and it will never come back. We have not priced that in. Yeah, here's a minor nightmare. The world's number one wheat exporter has invaded the world's number four wheat exporter and is systematically destroying the entire agricultural sector deliberately. Russia is going to see inhibitions in its ability to export for multiple reasons, but Ukraine will never be an exporter again. They will probably be a net importer by this point next year. And this is my personal nightmare. Russia isn't simply the world's largest exporter of fertilizers. It's the world's largest exporter of the materials that everyone else uses to make their own fertilizers. We've already seen significant disruptions to the flows. They're going to get, only get worse moving forward. Specifically, 40% of the world's potash comes from Belarus and Russia combined. Raw potash, forget the fertilizer, just the potash. We'll come back to that. One more minor issue and then we'll get into the big stuff. This was always gonna be the last decade of the People's Republic of China. Let's talk about the third most important reason why. We are having government collapse. Chairman Xi has instituted a per cult of personality far tighter than any world leader in history, including Mao, including the Chinese emperors of old, including Donald Trump. Okay, that was funny too. <laughs> He has intimidated into silence or imprisoned or executed everyone within not just the CCP, but the broader system who is capable of independent thought. He no longer has advisors. No one wants to bring him information because they don't know how he's going to react. He has literally shot the messenger so many times that he is making decisions in the dark. Now, this has horrible implications for any economic system. But in a one-man show, it means nothing gets done unless the leader gives you a written order or you're one of the zealots who sees him on TV and is like, oh, this must be what he meant. So when you see a small army of bureaucrats 
in head to toe um, surgical stuff out on a runway at an airport with a leaf blower spraying lime to disinfect the runway. That's the kind of policies we're getting out of China now. And of course, COVID, 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 COVID. Now, we're in the Midwest. I'm going to guess that there is a diversity of opinions in the room about COVID. <laughs> Some of us would probably side with vaccines, where others of us think that natural immunity is the way to go. And I think in the privacy of our own homes, when the door is closed and no one's listening, we do think to ourselves, you know, maybe the other side has a point. Okay, is that safe? China doesn't have these options, and it's not because of government. China was very successful for two years at keeping COVID out. No one has natural immunity. And the Chinese domestically generated vaccine doesn't work. Barely worked against the wild strain out of Wuhan, but then we had Alpha and Delta and Omicron and Omicron B and Omicron Threat Confucius 7 or wherever we are. It doesn't work at all versus the new stuff. And Omicron B, the one that is dominant in China and dominant here today. It's the most communicable virus pathogen that humans have ever struggled with. And the death rate from it is higher than any of the previous strains. And for us, this is a footnote because we all have multiple sources of resistance now, but the Chinese have none. And if they opened, you'd be looking at 5 million deaths in China a month for at least a quarter, minimum. So they can't. Lockdowns are their only policy tool. Shanghai went into lockdown on April 1. They came out on June 1. They nearly went into lockdown again last week. It's a little touch and go right now. We're all familiar with Vegas, right? What happens in Vegas totally leaves Vegas if it's a venereal disease. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> China right now is struggling with an outbreak in Macau, which is their Vegas. So you should be expecting major metropolitan lockdowns across the country within a month. This is China's new normal. They can no longer participate in manufacturing supply chains because they can't keep the factories open. They are prioritizing health. That comes at a cost. Now, they're gonna be losing access to Russian crude because of the war. They're losing access to manufacturing and employment because of their health policy. And we're having government failure as a managerial issue. All that really leaves is food security. Now we all know that they love their pork. And we all remember African swine fever from three years ago when they had to cull more cogs than the rest of the world has hogs commercially. Now they've started to get back in. Well, they've done more than start. They've offered a series of subsidies at the federal and the local levels in order to encourage hog farmers to re-enter the market, but they forgot to abrogate the debts of the hog farmers that went out of business because of ASF. So you've got two million dudes like me taking subsidies who have no idea what to do with a pig. And so they're buying food from everywhere in the world, even if it's not appropriate for hogs. So obviously they're going for soy and corn, but they're like getting broken rice out of India and like croissant grade wheat out of France to feed to pigs. Like the least efficient way to do it. And again, two million people who have no idea what they're doing. Now, according to Chinese statistics, there has been no ASF in the country for months. <laughs> She gets it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You look at a heat map of where the cases are in East Asia, and like all the borders are like red. <laughs> but in China, it's eh, everything's fine. Uh, they're probably in the midst of a fairly significant outbreak again. The question is how far and how loud does it get before they have to do another absolutely top to bottom mass culling? Whether that happens this year or next year, I don't know because Chinese data, eh. but we know it's coming. And if they don't have pork, all they've got left is rice. Rice is the most phosphate input intensive, in, uh, phosphate, in, blah, blah, blah. phosphate is the crop that needs the most. <laughs> Rice is the crop that is most phosphate intensive. Wow, that took like four tries. Uh, and so the, the Chinese have traditionally been the world's largest producer and exporter of phosphate because it's a food security issue. Well, they've stopped all exports until further notice. 
So we've lost potash because of the Ukraine war. We've lost phosphate because of Chinese mismanagement. Let's talk oil. This is total investment from all state and all private into all oil and all natural gas globally. And back in 2014, a narrative took hold in the financial centers of the world that fossil fuels were done. By 2030, we're gonna be off of them. And since it takes three to eight years to bring a field online, and another five to 15 years to break even, why in the world would you put your hard-earned money into a fossil fuel project when you will never get it back? Now, there's a lot of things about that line of reasoning that are wrong, in my opinion, but it took hold. And over the next several years, total investment into the space dropped by two-thirds. So lesson number one from that, it takes three to eight years to bring a new field online. If we triple investment today, we don't get back to 2019 prices until 2025, if we start today. Now that's what's true for the whole, the average. That doesn't necessarily hold true for each individual circumstance. This is by far my favorite graphic series. I like to call this the checkbook map, because every dot is someone who can pay their power bill. That's where the world's oil and gas comes from. This is, in one picture, a lot of the angst of the last 70 years. It's just, it isn't convenient to where we live. And getting it from A to B, that's part of the, part of the angst of the global system. Now watch North America. Watch Saudi Arabia. Here's where the shale is. There's 20 odd things about American shale that are fundamentally different compared to conventional energy. I think this is the most important one, at least for the moment. For us, only for us, we produce it where we live. And yeah, 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 the Texans are gonna bitch about having to get it across state lines, but it's not like you're going to central Siberia. This is easy, this is a good problem. Also, it doesn't take three to ten years to bring on a shale field. It takes three to eight weeks. Now, that was back in 2019 before we had the everything in shortage economy. Now it's more like three to eight months. But still, order of magnitude better. But not for anyone else. This is where the oil flows. The thicker the line, the more tankers are on that route. This is the route that matters the most. It is a convenient six to 7,000 mile sail from the Persian Gulf to the Chinese coast. Now we've all heard those stories about the Chinese having this massive navy, over 600 ships, versus our 290. However, 90% of the Chinese fleet would fit in this auditorium. Not all at the same time, don't be a dumbass. One at a time. They don't have range. If, if no one's shooting at them, so they can go slow and in a straight line to conserve fuel, they can go a thousand miles, maybe. Most of them are talking under 400 under a war scenario, whereas our fleet is entirely blue water. So, if there is a real conflict in which the Chinese are involved, someone who does not care for them, and that is a long list these days, is gonna put two destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin and cut the energy line, and China deindustrializes within a year. They are the most vulnerable economy on the planet. And that's only the second reason why I don't see the Chinese surviving the decade. Anyway, back to us. Uh, checkbook map again. I think you know where you are. This is the most important cluster of checkbooks in the history of human civilization. Marshalltown, Iowa, where I'm from. <laughs> Bismarck, North Dakota. Moving on. This is not a frat party. Population of Western North Dakota is what, 12? Yeah. <laughs> This is not just a bunch of dudes leaving the lights on. Yeah. It's lit up because of a problem with transport. Now, oil's a liquid. You can put it into a container or a rail car, a tanker truck, whatever. Natural gas disperses. And so much natural gas is bubbling up out of the fields as a byproduct that we have to flare it until we can build out the infrastructure to capture it and transport it. And you can see it from space. 
which means in the United States, only in the United States, not only is our oil and our gas produced where we live, for us, natural gas is a waste product. And waste product economics are brilliant because everyone loves free, right? This is what free looks like. This is Henry Hub. This is our primary natural gas pricing location. Uh, we don't have anyone here from the Gulf Coast, do we? Anybody, 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 anybody? Yeah, okay. They have these things called hurricanes. And back before 2008, about half of our natural gas was produced in the offshore Gulf. So when a storm would come through, they would have to shut down the platforms and evac them. The storm would rage by, and then they'd have to go back and spend weeks undoing the damage, and that manifested as sustained price increases. But by 2009, the majority of shale in the country, I'm sorry, the majority of natural gas in the country was produced onshore in the shale fields. And we don't care what the weather is onshore. So prices went low for a long time. Texans, of course, know what this little spike is. This is what happened last January when Texas got cold. <laughs> Aw, dropped down to 27. <laughs> they did not cope well. Prices almost tripled. And this, this right here, this, this little thing, this is what we're all bitching about right now. It's like we're, we're nowhere near the 50-year average yet, folks. And yet this has got us ripping our hair out. You guys want to see what the Chinese and the Europeans are bitching about? Because this is so much fun. <laughs> Europe's already in recession. I don't care what the statistics say. China would be in recession from this if it wasn't that they're probably in recession from the COVID lockdowns. Three years minimum for this to be fixed, assuming the Ukraine war stops tomorrow. We are looking at not a recession, we are looking at an energy-induced depression that is affecting multiple continents, probably already. But not here. This is a good problem. This gives us a competitive advantage in everything. Could we do better? Oh yeah. Could government policy be more on point? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the baseline that we're working from is pretty good here. All right. Uh, oh, oh, God, I hate this graphic. Um, this, is, this is the graphic that gives me nightmares. The deep blue, the deep green, those are the world's major producers and exporters of grain and soy-based calories. Everyone else on the map is a net import. Countries that are in orange and red import at least half of the calories they consume. In a world where the fertilizer system breaks down, We've lost potash because of the Russians. We've lost phosphate because of the Chinese and because of the natural gas price increases. A lot of Europeans have already stopped producing nitrogen. Here are the places looking at 40% reduction in their ability to grow the crop in the first place. This is famine. We will have it again in the fourth quarter of this year. We already know United States that a lot of farmers have crop switched away from corn and soy into things like hay that are less input intensive. We already know that in Sub-Saharan Africa, they're just not using as We won't have an idea of what yields might look like until probably mid-September. That's usually when we get our first good batch of data. It's not enough. We will easily be having a half a million to a billion, billion people this year suffering from malnutrition by year's end. And there's not a single thing going on the world right now that suggests to me that any of the fertilizer interruptions are going to be solved this year or next year. In fact, I anticipate them all to get significantly worse. A year problem. And it's going to change the production portfolio. Now, every on here is a row crop, but the brown is exclusively wheat. One of the fun things that happens with globalization is instead of competing within your own county and feeding your own county, you can specialize. You can produce whatever your climate and culture allows for you to do at volume for sending to other places. And in doing that, we stop growing wheat. So if you go back before World War II, the US was a big wheat state. But once globalization happened, we went into corn and soy because we could get more bang for our buck with that and we pushed wheat to the margins. Wheat is cold tolerant and drought tolerant and heat tolerant. 
So you grow it where nothing, where nothing else grows. And when you do that in the industrial age, you're growing the wheat on the margins in places where nothing would grow without those industrial inputs, things like fertilizer and irrigation. If those supply chains break down, not only can you, can you no longer grow wheat there, you have to grow wheat on your better land. And that means the volume of internationally traded agricultural commodities is in the early stages of collapse. but production isn't gonna overly change here. Because for us, most of the inputs are local. Let's compare that to the big competitor, Brazil. This is, um, this is Minnesota. Not that far away, weird people, but not that far away. <laughs> Winter triggers a soil recharge cycle, AKA free fertilizer. The Midwest, for the most part, is prairie soils. Soil being the right word. This is the Brazilian Cerrado. It's tropical savanna. And the way you grow crops in a tropical savanna is you wait for it to rain, you break out your bulldozer, you chain up a tree, you pull it out by the roots, and then you poison the soil for three to 20 years until you get rid of the excess acidity. You then are left with something with the consistency and the nutrient profile of beach sand. You can't grow stuff in sand unless you fertilizer the hell out of it. In terms of inputs per calorie produced, Brazil is the second least efficient producer in the world. But in a world of globalized agriculture and globalized inputs, this is a minor detail. Should something happen to the inflows, we have a very different situation. So here's the American fertilizer profile. The big numbers on the left, that's the percentage that's imported. We produce almost all of the nitrogen and phosphate we use. Our problem is potash, but we have Canada, also weird people. <laughs> but wow, are they reliable when it comes to commodity production. So we get over 80% of what we need from our northern neighbor. We only have 12% of our total vulnerability to one product that is dependent upon the Russian space. Is it inconvenient? Sure, but we've bitched about less. Here's Brazil. There is no Brazilian agricultural sector without Russian involvement. And Russian involvement is going away. It's the world's largest source of soy exports. And without global soy exports, there is not a global pork industry. Except here. And if we're being nice, Canada too. And folks, that's it. There's no China without this. There's no Spain or Germany without the stuff out of Ukraine. It is that simple, and we are now there. Now, the Brazilians were smart, and as soon as they realized things were getting real over in Ukraine, they forward pushed a lot of imports. They have more than enough for this season. And remember, they double crop. We don't know yet if they have enough for the next one in this year. They certainly aren't gonna have enough for 2023 catastrophic reductions in yield because these are not prairie soils. Without those inputs, there is nothing. There's only one competitor to keep an eye on. That's Argentina. A very similar climate to the Midwest, a little bit drier, but same deep prairie soils that we have here. Their problem as well is going to be getting the fertilizer. But this is a country that is already a significant exporter of soy and to a lesser degree corn. And if you're looking for simplicity, you want to produce the inputs that you need for your animal protein. Argentina is the only place out there that can now do that at scale, theoretically. Now, I'm sure you guys have all like, you know, Argentina, really? Argent freaking Tina? You know, they have made like every wrong choice that you possibly can in the last 90 years, and it shows. I don't mean to suggest that this is inevitable, and it's certainly not imminent. I'm saying it's the only really one to watch for. Now, as you all know, it's not just about inputs, it's also about hygiene, and hygiene is largely an issue of experience, technology, and above all, capital. And the Argentinians have had to import all of their capital for most of the last 50 years. And they're not alone. This is net worth. As you age, your net worth increases. 
At first, you're spending everything on your kids and your cars and your college and your home. But as you move into your 40s, the kids are moving out and the house is getting paid out down. And that last decade before you retire, you're at the peak of your earning and your expenses have dropped. And that makes you the wealthiest you will ever be for your life. And then you retire and you liquidate your stocks and your bonds and you go into T-bills and cash because you won't be able to take the pain of a currency correction or a market crash. You will never have income again. And so if you keep everything engaged and the market falls, you're destitute. Can't afford it, have to go conservative. It's pretty normal. Now historically, that hasn't really mattered because until we industrialized in the 1950s, this is what our demographic profile looked like. Children's at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. And the sliver up there in the early 60s, it's small. It's always been small. Historically speaking, to the, back to the dawn of humanity, it's small. And there have always been more people in their 50s than their 40s. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. There have already been more people in their 50s than their 60s than their 40s than their 50s. And so if a small group leaves and a larger group is coming up behind, it's the same ratio each and every year. But when we industrialized and urbanized and globalized in the 50s and 60s, that changed. Because when you live on the farm, especially pre-industrial, kids are free labor. You have a lot. My mom's here, what do you have, like 37 brothers and sisters? Yeah. <laughs> But globalization and industrialization means urbanization because people move into the cities to take value-added services and manufacturing jobs. And so when my mom moved into town, she went from being one of 37 to having three kids. Because when you move into town, kids are no longer free labor. They are very loud. They are very annoying. They are very expensive mobile pieces of furniture. And adults aren't dumb. <laughs> Most adults aren't dumb. Here's us. We've all heard, you know, that blah, 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 the baby boomers, how are we gonna afford their retirement? That's, that's legitimate. But it's from a capital point that I'm really concerned. They're the largest generation we've ever had. They're moving into retirement. On average, the boomers retire in the fourth quarter of this year. We are almost there. And they're taking all of their money with them. They're going to lock it into very uninteresting things like T-bills and they will stay there until they pass on which on average will not be this decade. So we know that the velocity of capital isn't simply going to slow or stop, it is going to go into screaming reverse. And the cost of capital has to increase by at least a factor of four in the next 12 calendar months. The fact that we're going through an economic tightening cycle at the same time is just bad luck. It's gonna magnify everything. Capital has never been this cheap and it never will be this cheap again. So if you need to borrow if you, for anything for the next 20 years, like go do it, like right now. They're, they're recording this, you can watch it later <laughs> because you will never have this opportunity again. That's the capital thing. There's also a workforce thing. So boomers, largest generation we've ever had, retiring this year. That is the single largest factor behind the inflation that we're feeling right now, labor inflation. Because this generation, the Zoomers, the young bucks that are coming up from below, they're the smallest generation we've ever had. In calendar year 2022, that is a shortage of 400,000 workers. And that will increase each and every year for the next 12 until we peak in 2034 with a shortage of 900,000. Only then will it start to get bigger or better. And we know that's exactly where it's gonna go because all the baby boomers are here. They've been here since 1965. We know exactly how many there are. And the Zoomers, they've all been here for a few years too. We know exactly what the inflows and the outflows into the market look like for the next 20 years. It's not great. But it is so much worse elsewhere. Here are the big four economies of the world, the Europeans, the Chinese, the Japanese, and us. The bottom two were terminal 20 years ago. When your birth rate changes and you have start having fewer kids, it doesn't manifest immediately. But if you do it for 60 years, it's not that you've run out of children. You ran out of children 40 years ago. You're running out of adults now. And we're looking at mass retirement across the world. 
Now, there is something very different about the American demography, and it's right here. We know them as, ugh, millennials. <laughs> <sighs> mm, I just threw up on my mouth a little bit. <sighs> American boomers did one thing that none of their cohorts in the rest of the world did. They had kids. And, you know, we can talk all day about the millennials, and oh, can I? But they have one thing going for them that their equivalent around the world does not have going for them. Here, they exist. They're consuming today. They will be investing in a few years. They are uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> now let's talk about China. Here's the number one reason why you should not expect to be selling anything to China by the end of the decade, perhaps as early as next year. That demographic structure was already the world's fastest aging workforce as of January of 2000. This is already well past the point of terminal collapse. If they were gonna fix this, they missed it by 30 years. We now know that this data is wrong. The Chinese have completed their 10-year census. They're starting to release the data in bits and pieces, not all at once because it's really bad and they're now publicly admitting that they overcounted their population by in excess of 100 million people, all of whom were born since the one-child policy was adopted, so people 40 and under, and the vast majority of whom were women because of selective sex abortions applied in mass. The yellow bars probably don't exist. We don't have an economic theory that suggests that that leads to anything but full-scale societal collapse. It's just a question of whether it happens in 2029 or 2023. And when I look at the energy situation and I look at the Ukraine war and I look at the import disruptions and the flows and nationalism and Trump and Biden and all the rest, I gotta say, it's looking like it's gonna be sooner rather than later. When I speak to pork groups for the last few years, I've been telling you, if you bet the farm on sales to China, you will lose the farm. It doesn't mean there's no hope. It does mean you need to look elsewhere, like these four. Vietnam, Indonesia, Mexico, Colombia, these are your markets of the future. Vietnam is already the world's most pork-hungry country, eating more per person than any country in the world, including China and there's over 120 million of them. Indonesia, 260 million people, nominally Muslim, but they still like pork. <laughs> Southeast Asia is like weirder America. Mexico, likely to be the fastest growing economy in the world for the next 30 years. We have the healthiest demography in the advanced world. They have the healthiest demography in the advanced developing world. Courtesy of Donald Trump, we are linked together with NAFTA too. There are a lot of things about Trump I'm not a fan of. That was a stroke of genius. Thank God. It, it wasn't just negotiated, it's implemented, folks. It's done. And one word, carnitas. <laughs> nom, nom, nom. It's like, I gave a presentation to like poultry farmers of America a few years ago, like if you can get the Mexicans into Thanksgiving, I mean, what, what, what about Thanksgiving does not sound Mexican? Family gathering with food, I mean, come on. It's like, this is a low carry here, people. Uh, because of the breakdown of global trade, North America broadly needs to double the size of its industrial plant in a very short period of time. Mexico is part of that solution. And Mexican farmland is awful. They need to import about a third of their food. Where do you think they get it from? And then finally, Colombia. Uh, the biggest problem that Mexico faces is that there's just not enough of them. There's only 130 million people in the country, and we're losing roughly a billion person workforce out of China. Mexico can't do it all. They need some help. Colombia is the country most likely to help. So Colombia top five list for fastest growing economies for the next 30 years. We already have an FTA with the Colombians. So this, this is your replacement plan. If you are not selling to these countries, find a way. They all like pork too, so that's that. Okay, final slide. Uh, this is CPI, the Americans and the Canadians. Sibling countries, very similar. It tracks as you would expect. 
There have been three big phases for inflation since World War II. First, the original post-war build-out. This is when most of what we consider to be the advanced world fully industrialized. Remember, we didn't finish this process in the United States until the 60s. This is roads, this is power plants, this is asphalt, this is electrical grids. Industrial demand-driven inflation. Then we had the baby boomers come of age. Houses, cars, kids. Consumer-driven demand inflation. And then we had this glorious period that we all think of as normal. The Soviet system collapsed, and an empire's worth of raw commodities was dumped on global markets, whether it was oil and gas, or wood, or wheat, or aluminum. Kept prices low for a generation. And the Chinese entered the global system in 1989, a billion workers pushing down the cost of manufactured goods. We had 30 years of the lowest inflation ever recorded in human history. It is not normal. And it's ending. The Chinese labor is going away. The Russian commodities are going away. And we have to deal with a double spike now. Because while the baby boomers are retiring, the millennials are here. And they're in the prime of their consumption years. And we need to double the size of the industrial plant in the next five years. Every disinflationary trend we have benefited from in the last generation is flipping. And every inflationary trend we have dealt with in the last two generations is coming back on steroids. Your mid-case scenario should be inflation of 9 to 15% for at least the next five years. Now, I realize that's kind of a <gasps> But it will likely also be paired with the fastest economic growth we have seen in this country in decades. There's not a lot that the government can do to make this easier. There is a lot the government can do to make it worse. And when I look at who we've elected the last three times, I can't say I'm overly confident there. But your sector produces the thing we can't live without. I don't care what happens with government policy when it comes to agriculture because the macroeconomic, the secular, the demographic, the geopolitical trends that are hitting the rest of global agriculture are devastating and they cannot be adapted to. Here you don't face any of that. So, starting later this year, you're gonna look out of the world and you're gonna see famine and you're gonna feel really bad and then you're gonna change a few things because you're gonna try to feed the world and you're gonna fail. You don't have enough of a lever and the problem's too big and you're gonna go downtrodden, and then you're gonna look at your bank statement. And then you're just gonna laugh. You're gonna to have to put your heart in a safe deposit box. But you are looking at the fastest expansion in farm incomes per person and per acre that we have ever seen in this country's history, and it will last for at least the remainder of this decade. It is not a straight line from here to there. But I think you'll cope. Okay, if you're looking for something to throw at your neighbor, here are the old books. Uh, feel free to sign up for the newsletter. It is free. It will always be free. All sales from all three of these books in all formats and two, until future notice are being donated to the Afya Foundation, which is a charity that is providing medical assistance to the Ukrainian refugee community. That's a third of the population of the country right now. So buy a book. I'll make a donation for you. Go to the website. Do it yourself. Uh, and then this bad boy dropped two weeks ago. Yeah. It was supposed to be out in uh, May, but there was a paper shortage. Um, <laughs> uh, we made the bestseller list yesterday, and we beat out Matt McConaughey. So, If, if Matt sees this, don't take it badly, man. I love your work, you're a great guy, but I'm better because the New York Times says so. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, do we have time for some q and A? I I don't think we do. I okay. think the food is ready. All right, but you I will be, be lingering, around. yes. Okay, awesome. Let's give all the speakers from this morning a round. Thank you.